First, I wanted to thank Dr. Crawford for inviting me and including me. I appreciate it. Uh, my task is to talk about MRI of the prostate. And as Dr. Klotz mentioned earlier, there's been an absolute explosion of data. And it's somewhat challenging to take all the data and condense it into a talk. Uh, but I've done my best. There's a fair amount of data in here we're going to move through quickly, but hopefully you find it useful and practical. So I have one relevant disclosure late in the talk uh, about an upcoming trial that we're involved in. So the six things I wanted to talk to you about, sort of MRI at different stages. MRI for screening prior to initial biopsy, prior to a repeat biopsy. What's the data on using it in surveillance? What about staging patients and operative planning? And then MR-guided ablation, which we've seen more of lately. When I think of prostate cancer and take a step back, sort of the 10,000-foot view, I think of it as the good, the bad, and the ugly. The good news is fewer men are dying of prostate cancer. The good news is we have all these novel tools, tests, and drugs that we've heard about. The bad news is there's a pandemic of overdiagnosis and overtreatment, which we're doing better at. And on the other end of the spectrum, we have often insufficient treatment for men with really advanced disease. And then the ugly, which I think we need to shine on ourselves, is screening and treatment patterns, the preventive services task force, and then the explosion of cost with all these novel tools and tests. Bottom line in the United States, smart prostate cancer screening can save lives, 50% fewer men dying of prostate cancer. I think this is underappreciated within the medical community. We should be shouting this from the rooftops and be incredibly proud of it. But you can't talk about that without talking about the elephant in the room, which is overdiagnosis and overtreatment. And the reason I mention this as a lead in, when I think of how to minimize overdetection and overtreatment, I think of the seven things on the slide there as real practical ways of minimizing overdetection and overtreatment, and the bolded five MRI can help play a role in. So I do think MRI is incredibly useful in helping progress the care of men with prostate cancer. So some basics on MRI, and this could be a whole talk in of itself, but just to download some info. Wait at least six to eight weeks after a biopsy to limit inflammation and hemorrhage that might obscure your pictures. There's a whole literature on what type of magnet, what type of coil do you use one. In general, three Tesla is better than 1.5 Tesla. Some groups get away from an endorectal coil for patient comfort and logistics, but most of the data suggests the quality of the pictures are better with an endorectal coil. Everyone uses a phase array body coil. And then the sequences matter. The reason it's called multiparametric is, in general, there's three different types of sequences. The most valuable is probably DWI, diffusion-weighted imaging, which gets you an ADC map. Second best is T2, and that's more anatomic, but can also show some cancers. By far the least useful is DCE, which is dynamic contrast enhanced. The size matters. It makes sense, but the larger something is, the more likely to see it. But most, or, or equally importantly, is the location matters. So all these different anatomic zones, the way the radiologists interpret potential cancers are different depending on what part of the prostate they're looking at. And then a key point, which I would encourage you to do at your home center, is not only does the experience of the radiologist matter, but the expertise does as well. Just because someone's read a lot of them doesn't necessarily make them good, kind of like surgery. Just because you do a lot of surgery doesn't mean you're necessarily a good surgeon. And the feedback loop of data is incredibly valuable if you find a radiologist that can continue to look at MRIs, get better, and you can learn how useful MRI is at your institution. This is incredibly important, this last line. There's a bunch of data within this past year, mostly from UCLA and NYU, that MRI underestimates the tumor volume most commonly rather than the opposite. And this is incredibly important for biopsy or potential ablation. I do think MRI is valuable, but I tell patients all the time, we can't hang our hat on it. Depending on your institution, it's good or great, but it's far from perfect. It should be integrated into decision making. The PIRAD system, which you've probably heard of, is an ordinal system of grading the likelihood of there being cancer. It's sort of been strong-armed through as the de facto way of measuring it. There's many other systems out there that are often useful. And just another uh, point, to look at your own data at your institution or at your medical center if you can. So now let's go through every little stage on what the data shows. So MRI for screening, it's being done at some places. I think it's the cart before the horse. There's no compelling data that it should be used for screening. Hopefully we get there. In essence, with an MRI for screening, you want to know how reliable is a negative MRI. A clean MRI, what's the likelihood of a meaningful cancer? Four institutions here, mixed cohorts. Bottom line is Gleason 7 or higher on a biopsy 
is less than 10%, as low as 1%. So it's not zero. And a negative MRI, if a guy doesn't want to have a biopsy, I tell him, here's our data at our institution. 6% chance you're missing a Gleason 7 or higher. And some guys say, I still want the biopsy, and some say no. The flip side of it is how reliable is a positive MRI. These are two institutions using two different types of MRI. The reference standard was different, whether it was transperineal or radical prostatectomy. But the PIRAD scoring system is useful as it gets higher, the higher the likelihood of getting cancer. And Lori Klotz's data that he just presented is incredibly valuable because his PIRADS numbers were very different than what's presented in the literature. And what's relevant for his patients or Canadian patients at those institutions, you can't rely on this published data from two centers of excellence. We will eventually have data relatively soon on the role of a screening MRI. So there's a big trial that we're involved with, and it's the precision trial. And I'll just walk you through it. It's biopsy naive men with an elevated PSA. They get an MRI done. If it's negative, no biopsy. But if it's positive, they're targeted. And then the randomization to the other arm is just a standard 12-core truss biopsy. And the primary outcome is Gleason 7 or higher. It's accruing ahead of schedule. There will be 460 men. This is the algorithm. You don't biopsy PIRADS 1 or 2. You biopsy 3s, 4s, and 5s. And we will have very meaningful data on whether it's worthwhile or worthless in this setting. What about routine MRI prior to an initial biopsy? It is done routinely at select centers. We have a big center in Chicago where before every first biopsy, everyone gets an MRI. I do not routinely do it. The NCC, NCCN does not recommend it, though if you look at the guidelines, they do say and sort of hint at it that MRI could potentially be useful to find more aggressive cancers and keep your hands off the Gleason 6s. So I would not be surprised if at some point this gets integrated in, but on a population-based level in the US where MRI is very expensive, it's just hard to imagine before every single biopsy everyone gets an MRI, but perhaps we'll get there at some point. In Europe and other places, MRI is a lot more cost-effective because it's cheaper. Now, there's a load of pa papers out there on the role of MRI before a biopsy. This is probably the single best known for good reason at a center of excellence. And this is out of the NCI, and it was published in JAMA. A thousand men undergoing an MRI before a biopsy. Only about 20% of them it was at their initial biopsy. 80% was a repeat. And the take-home message is it helps you find more higher Gleason-grade lesions and helps you not find the Gleason 6s as frequently which I think is favorable. The great news is we even have some randomized studies now on the use of MRI, and I'm presenting a couple of them to you throughout this talk. This is a randomized study that's in press out of Italy, and this is 212 men with an elevated PSA and a normal DRE, and they're randomized to getting a biopsy 1.5 Tesla with an endorectal coil. If there's lesions there, they target the lesions. If there's no lesions, they get a standard 12 core. The other half of the study, just get your regular 12 core biopsy, no MRI. What does it show? In this study, the MRI kicked butt. It basically found a lot more cancer, which I don't think necessarily is an advantage, but most importantly, it found a lot more clinically significant cancers. And if you look at the third row there, 43% clinically significant cancers in the MRI arm, only 18% in the control arm. That's meaningful information. And at this center, or in this trial, a negative MRI was pretty powerful. So only basically 4% of the guys with a negative MRI had a Gleason 7 or higher. So that's good feedback data for that institution, where maybe men at, with that technology at that institution, with those people reading it, don't necessarily need a biopsy if they have a normal MRI. This is a well-known study. It was presented at ASCO last year, and it was just recently released within the past couple weeks in Lancet Oncology from the group in, uh, spearheaded by the group out of the University of College in London, but it was more of a population-based study. It took place at 11 centers throughout the UK, and they tried to make it as transferable as possible. So they did a 1.5 Tesla MRI without an endorectal coil, guys with an elevated PSA and a normal DRE, and God bless these 576 men. They all had an MRI, then they all had a 12-core truss biopsy, and then they all underwent transperineal mapping. So this is for the love of science, and uh, I'm, I'm you know, selfishly, I'm glad they did it because it provided useful data. The UCL group has really, you know, woven the flag on a primary endpoint of a meaningful cancer is primary pattern four, 
or tumor length more than six millimeters. That's a separate discussion on whether that's appropriate or not, but in this trial, that's what they used. Here's their data. The red is a clinically significant cancer based on the PIRAD score. So yet more evidence that some type of ordinal system, scoring system, helps you determine the likelihood of there being a meaningful cancer there. Now, the ideal test, if you think about it, you want a high sensitivity and a high negative predictive value. So you want to identify all the guys with a meaningful cancer. That's a sensitivity uh, that's high. And you want a high negative predictive value. So if you have a normal scan, you don't have to subject them to a biopsy. And MRI basically destroyed transrectal ultrasound in sensitivity and negative predictive value. And you can see the numbers there in the table. Now, what about the clinically significant cancers that were missed in this trial? Basically, no matter what your definition of the significant cancer, and the Gleason 6 there is more than six millimeters of Gleason 6, and the others are Gleason 7, but basically MRI was far less likely to miss a meaningful cancer compared to what most people do is just a trust-guided biopsy. So the conclusion of this PROMISE trial, which I think is a landmark trial, is that a negative MRI as a triage test would avoid biopsies in about a quarter of men, and you basically diagnose the same amount of clinically significant cancers. I think that's an advance. The only additional thing is the added cost and logistics of the MRI. A positive MRI, so the flip side of it, with only targeting those lesions, detects more cancers than if you just across the board did a truss biopsy. So a really well done study showing MRI is useful. Now what about men with a previously negative biopsy? NCCN guidelines show this is a very complex and, uh, and muddy space. There are a whole bunch of biomarkers, urine, tissue, blood, and imaging that can contribute to this space. I essentially think of MRI as a biomarker. I think it's an anatomic marker and a biologic marker. And it can be useful in this space, just like many other things can be useful in this space. Recently, the AUA, as well as the Society of Abdominal Radiology, put some, you know, uh, some content experts together, and we put together some guidelines or recommendations for using MRI in men who had a previously negative biopsy. And most of this is self-evident but this is the take home points of the, of the paper. Basically, higher PIRADS lesions probably warrant a biopsy. There's many different ways of targeting these lesions, in bore, cognitive, fusion technology, and at least two cores should be taken from each target. And then a targeted biopsy alone, and I keep bringing up this point, should only be considered once you've looked at data at your big institution, at your group, to know whether that's a smart move for that individual patient going forward. Another randomized trial. Now, this is a randomized trial using MRI for men with a previously negative biopsy. PSA remains greater than four. They all undergo an MRI, and if there's a lesion on the MRI, they're randomized. And one arm is basically just targeting the MRI lesion, and the other arm is targeting the lesion plus your standard 12 core. And at the interim analysis, this was halted because they were basically equivalent. Whether you wanted to find all the cancers, just the Gleason 7s or higher, the targeted MR biopsies basically got you all the information you needed, and you didn't have to do the 12 core. Now remember, these are guys with a previously negative biopsy. So it suggests that perhaps in this clinical state, maybe just targeting the MRI lesions is all we need to do. What about MRI for active surveillance? So it makes a lot of sense. There's a load of data out there on MRI. I love this one out of the University of Toronto because it's so simple and it makes sense and the data is so dramatic. 60 guys with low risk cancer all getting restaged with an MRI and a repeat biopsy to look for higher grade cancers. They made their radiologists commit on the MRI to say it's either normal, something less than one centimeter, or something greater than one centimeter. Pretty clear cut. And look at the dramatic difference in upgrading looking at that just simple three tiered system which speaks to the power of the MRI for these restaging biopsies in guys with low volume cancers. How do I do surveillance? Well, I get an MRI fusion restaging biopsy, similar to what the guys at Toronto, the women and men at Toronto did. I typically do it within six months. Some guys want to do it sooner. Some guys want to wait a little bit longer. Not a huge deal. A PSA and DRE every six months. Uh, NCCN guidelines and most experts say you don't need to be checking it every three months a surveillance biopsy every one to three years, and it's easy to risk stratify based on age, health, 
total millimeters of cancer at their initial diagnosis, and PSA density. Those are your big ticket items. How much Gleason 6 cancer was there, and what's their PSA density. I don't think there's any convincing data yet for routine surveillance MRI. However, I'm going to show you data to suggest that maybe we'll be getting there at some point. So what's the data on use of MRI while a guy's on surveillance? Here's the data from Sloan Kettering, a bit of a mixed bag in different types of MRIs. About a third of their patients were found to have Gleason upgrading, but if you look to the right there on the figure, basically the higher the Likert score or PIRAD score, the more likely you are to find a higher grade Gleason score. And the black there are the targeted biopsies. So most of the higher grade cancers were found from targeting the MRI lesions. Convincing data. NCI also has a similar study where they took these lower intermediate risk men and they're looking for worse cancers and using MRI. 30% were upgraded. Their definition of MRI progression is not commonly used, but they basically gave points for each of the three things listed there, and you got either zero, one, two, or three points, and lo and behold, look, the more points you got on your MRI, the more likely you are to find those higher Gleason scores, encouraging data that MRI is useful. UCLA data, a similar study, guys on active surveillance, they have a three Tesla MRI without an endorectal coil. Of the men who were upgraded, 32 of the 33 men, that area of upgraded, of upgrading was found within the lesion on MRI. So three centers of excellence, three well done studies suggesting that maybe MRI should be useful for guys that are on surveillance. Now, should they get it? How often do they, can you obviate the biopsy? These are all questions worth asking that require prospective analysis. What about MRI for staging and operative planning? I think the two big ticket items that MRI is not as good as we'd all hope, and patients need to understand this. I mentioned one earlier, it tends to underestimate tumor volume, and then the operating characteristics for looking for ECE and seminal vesicle invasion, not great. So if you're gonna get an MRI before a radical prostatectomy, do not hang your hat on the MRI suggests or don't suggest ECE and make your nerve sparing decision solely on that. I do think the pictures can be useful, but integrate it into all the other information you have about that guy before you go to the operating room. This is a study out of UCLA where they did MRIs before the prostatectomy. They whole mounted all of the pathology. And as you can see here, the blue is basically identifying it or detecting it on MRI, and the orange is missing it. So it doesn't project great, but as the tumor diameter gets bigger, the more likely you are to see it on MRI. As the Gleason score gets higher, the more likely you are to see it. Index lesions are far more likely to be seen than non-index lesions. And what about predicting ECE? This is sort of a caution, a, a well-done study at a center of excellence that have been pioneers in MRI of the prostate. So nearly 200 men that underwent a radical prostatectomy, they all had an MRI beforehand, 50% had ECE, and look at that sensitivity and negative predictive value. So I would argue you should not be making your nerve sparing decision solely on your MRI. MRI actually does a decent job of picking up gross ECE, sort of macroscopic ECE. It does a really poor job of picking up microscopic ECE. So a UCLA study uh, that was done on MRIs and how it impacts nerve sparing, the short summary of this is it changed the plan for nerve sparing in about a quarter of patients. But I would echo what was mentioned in an earlier session, you have no idea if that change was a good thing or a bad thing. So the MRI might have told me, well, I'm not nerve sparing on that side, I'm going wide, but you might have just resected a guy who was organ confined on that side and took his nerve with it. So unfortunately, without erectile function data as an outcome, which wasn't reported, you don't know if that change in plan was ultimately good for the patient. Here's a well done study, a randomized control trial of using MRI before prostatectomy. Over 400 men getting a robotic prostatectomy, randomized to no MRI versus a 1.5 Tesla MRI, and the positive margin rate was no different on whether they had an MRI or not. Now, a subset analysis, which was not the primary analysis, suggested that amongst low-stage patients, perhaps it was useful in decreasing the rate of positive margin. Kudos to these investigators for studying it, but again, unfortunately, there's no erectile function data. 
And just because you lowered the positive margin rate doesn't necessarily mean that was a good long-term strategy for that man. I'm running out of time, and I want to be respectful of the others, so I'm going to really whip through the rest of it. MRI is useful pr for predicting continence, and basically the ureth urethral width and the urethral volume can be useful. There's a bunch of studies that suggest that urethral length can help predict long-term continence. I'm not aware of anyone that gets an MRI, measures the urethral length, and then says, oh, your rate of continence is going to be so low, you shouldn't have a prostatectomy. And then lastly, but importantly, MR-guided treatment. Many different ways of doing this. We are in the very early stages of, of, of developing it. We've participated in a couple trials. We've done a phase one and a phase two of in the MRI machine, putting lasers into regions of the prostate that have concordant cancer and MRI lesion, and the rest of their prostate looks healthy. The laser basically heats up and ablates that area. We've shown it's safe. We've shown that the early data, the primary endpoint, 96% of the guys no longer had cancer in that region of the prostate at three months when we biopsied it. I have no idea what the long-term outcomes are going to be, uh, but I'll be happy to shout it out whether it's worthwhile or worthless down the road. It's basically safe. We've proven that there's a very low rate of side effects from it, but from an oncologic standpoint, unknown. There's people doing MRI, trust fusion, focal cryo, not great data published. There's great PSA responses. This is a study where they didn't do any follow-up biopsies, so you should shrug your shoulders as to what's going on within the prostate. Here's a trial, a phase one study. This is transurethral ultrasound ablation in the MRI machine. This was a safety study. It basically showed it's safe. The median treatment time was about a half hour. That is just the time ablating the prostate. The total treatment time is significantly longer, on the order of three to six hours of spending time in the early learning curve of trying to do this technology. Now, remember how long the first lap nephrectomy took, the first lap prostatectomy, maybe we'll get the times down. For most men, there's no impact on quality of life. However, a beacon call in this phase one, and remember, phase ones aren't meant to look at oncologic outcomes, but after this treatment, 30% of men continued to have clinically significant cancers within their prostate, and this was whole gland treatment. So in conclusion, hopefully you'll agree with me based on the data I've showed you. Bottom line is MRI can be helpful. There are significant limitations to it. Use it wisely. Get feedback within your own institution. We dreamed for years of imaging prostate cancer. In the last 10 to 20 years, we are now able to much better. 